I uh, was gone for a couple of weeks, and I so wanted to speak about a new year. How many are glad it's 23 and not 22? How many are glad it's 23 and not 20? How many would want to relive that again? Ah, I had to think this week as I was getting ready for the message, like, man, so much has water has went under the bridge, has it not? And we're back to, I think, I'm, I'm back to, well, I don't know if y'all are normal, but I'm normal. 23 is going to be a good year. How many believe that? Amen. I, uh, I, it was interesting. On January the 2nd, on a Monday night, uh, I, I really like watching football. And how many were watching the most anticipated game of the season, and about seven minutes in, the game was over? How many know what I'm talking about? Okay, how many don't know what I'm talking about? All right, so Monday night football, and the Cincinnati Bengals are playing the Buffalo Bills, and I, I was all pumped up for this because I just, I, I like I like Joe Burrows. Part of the reason is he reminds me of Matthew Mullen Jr. Where is he at? Is he here this morning? Yeah, stand up, Matthew, so they can get a good look at Joe Burrow lookalike right there. Yeah, right there. Go ahead, stand up. Yep, there he is. See, that's Joe Burrows. Y'all just don't know it. So, <clears throat> no, but if you know his story, it's like Joe Burrows, like, coming out of uh, LSU and just being this good football player, and, and I was, I, I, I'm pulling for him. I really am. However, I don't think they'll get past the Buffalo Bills anytime. So, I'm picking Buffalo Bills as the uh, Super Bowl champs, just so you know. Uh, I was anticipating this game, and all of a sudden, this guy goes down, DeMar Hamlin. And I'm sitting there watching it because nobody really knew what happened, right? And yet, one man on the first Monday night of 23 goes down and the whole, not just the nation, not just football fans, but the whole world was spellbound, wasn't it? And then I started seeing some things, and, and of course, me and Becky are watching it because, and, and the kids were all sitting there, and it kind of became emotional because now we're finding out that it was a, it was a V-fib thing or A-fib thing. They weren't quite sure at that time, and that's what Becky had. It, it is exactly the same, and we watched the squad pull in onto the field, and in all my years of watching football, I've never seen that happen before. And here he backed into, the squad backed out, and, and of course all the players are, are around, and now they're kneeling down and they're, they're having prayer. You can see prayer meetings going on. And then I watched social media. There's a couple clips of social media. How many saw that where the whole sections were repeating the Lord's Prayer at the same time? And then not only that, a little bit later on, if you were watching Sports Center, one of the news anchors there actually said, you know what, let's not talk about praying, let's do it now. And he prays on national TV. How many saw that? Wasn't that awesome? God deserves a clap offering this morning. That's amazing. And I had to think, God, what are you doing? And I heard it. God is opening up doors in 23 like he's never opened before. And I believe that with my whole heart. I think God is shifting some things around. And guess what? Tamar Hamlin will be at the game today. Or tomorrow night. Is it tomorrow night? Help me out. Tomorrow night, I think. Is God a miracle worker? And all of a sudden when it was at the end of everything else, let's pray. And the whole world joined in in prayer. And God performed a miracle. So a lot to be thankful for. But I'm looking at it like there's some major doors that God wants to open. And I believe it's for us, especially at, as the church. We need to be looking for these opportunities, these doors that will be open because we are very, very relevant in the kingdom of God. As Christians, we need to take these opportunities serious. And as passive as it could be or, or as, as inadequate as you think it might be, these are opportunities to witness. These are opportunities to expound on, yeah, we serve, I serve a God that did that. What do these doors look like? My goal this morning, 
throughout this message is so that we know and we make sure that we know which doors to go through. I was talking earlier and, and someone had told me that they, they always thought any door that's open is the one that God opened. And I'm here to tell you it's not. So we want to look at that a little bit in the time that we have and make sure that we know and that we recognize when it's God's doors that are opening for us and not someone else opening a door of opportunity to distract us or maybe it's Satan setting a trap for us. And it's interesting to me as I was studying this, scripture actually gives reference to and, uh, and implies to a door 400 times, over 400 times in scripture. Now, a door is something that we use every day, and it's a, we can use metaphors for those important uh, things in our lives. And sometimes God opens doors, some God, sometimes God shuts doors. And I believe that doors even have a great spiritual metaphor in our lives. We all have many, many doors. I and mean, in fact, we don't even realize how many doors we have. I sat down, uh, and Mason started, me and Mason, talking about how many doors we have. How many, I'm just going to, for a raise of hands, how many have a sliding door in your home? Sliding door? How many have a pocket door? I, I don't. How many have a front door? Yeah. How many have a basement door? How about a Dutch door? Do you know what a Dutch door is? It's the one where the half of it stays shut and the other top swings open. How many have one of those? Lucky nobody. Okay, all right, cool. Garage door? How about an attic door? God forbid, if you don't have a bathroom door, please get one. <laughs> bathroom door. <laughs> How about an automatic door? How about a shower door? And of course, Mason knows where the refrigerator door is. Some of you shouldn't. I'm talking to myself. I shouldn't. Revolving door. Do you have one? Bet the ladies can tell us where they're at, like the malls and stuff. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I'll, I'll be nice. Everybody has this one. How about the squeaky door? Yeah. All it would take is a little WD-40. Just saying. How many of you have a magic door? How many have a secret door? It's not a secret anymore, is it? Raise your hand if you have one. I'm kidding. Doors have a great spiritual significance in our lives. A door can either be an entrance or it can be an exit. It can be a bridge to something better. It can lead us from our reality that we're in now. And we walk through it and, and walk into a destiny that is bigger and better than what we ever dreamed of. A door can say welcome on it, and it can say not welcome on it. It represents acceptance, and it can represent rejection. It can separate things. It can keep critters out at night, and it can keep warm and cool air in, and it protects us. So many implications of a door. And I believe God is going to open so many for us here at Light in the Valley and for all of you. I know he has for me, and I recognize it. And I'm so grateful, and I'm so thankful for the doors that he has opened for me. When you read scripture and you read how many different implications and, and metaphors there are, that's a, that he uses the door as an entrance into salvation. He uses it as a discipling passage, like you, you, you open that door to disciple people. It's a passage to discipleship. In your ministry, it's a door of service. It's a service door that's open. And I, I, I get uh, excited when I think about this, of the missionaries that we at Light the Valley have out there. We have opened our, our, our mission door, the outside door to the outside world. We have sent people out. We're continuing to send people out. I know we have a young lady here who's, who's signing up to go to Aim Right, I believe, next year again. And so that's awesome. That is awesome to see. It's, it's, it's one of those, the, the, the door to the mission field, the access door of prayer. We use prayer as an access door to heaven. 
And I know Furman brought a message on, on, the, uh, on New Year's Day about the prayer. And that's a doorway to heaven. Our worship here is a door into God's presence and into his holiness. We use that as a door. So many implications. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 8. And here's probably where we'll hiccup a little bit. Kate, I don't know if uh, we'll, we'll see if we got it up there or not. Maybe not. Oh, yep, there it is. I probably wrote this down in a different translation than what is up there. But uh, through de technical difficulties this morning, I give Caden a hand. He, he, on the last minute, I just texted him my references during uh, the worship service, and he got them up there. So I'm going to read it in, in the translation that I have it in. And Jesus is basically saying, if you know anything about the very last book of the Bible, it's Revelation. And he's writing a letter. He had John write it, but Jesus, it's written in red. Jesus was saying it. John was recording it. And it was letters to different churches. There were seven different churches. This happened to be the church at Philadelphia, which the Philadelphia church in the Greek, and it would be translated to the city of brotherly love, the, the city itself of Philadelphia. So here it is. I hold the key of David in my hand. This is Jesus saying this and he says this the doors that I unlock and open no one else can close <clears throat> and any doors that I shut and lock no one will ever be able to open now I know everything you have done so look I am placing before you an open door that no one can shut and I know that you are not very strong, but you've kept my word and you've been faithful to me. Jesus is saying that to the church there at Philadelphia. I would like to parallel that with us here at Light in the Valley today. We can take some things out of that. And I believe God's word is true even for them and for us today. This literally what Jesus is saying is this is a door of opportunity that I'm putting before you. He's saying I know that you don't have it all together. I sure don't. And if you do, you probably won't fit in here very well because I know most of you. He's saying, I know that you're not that spiritually strong. I know you're trying, but at least you have stayed with me is what he's saying. You, you, you continue to show up and you continue to come in. You haven't denied me. You're here. And so I'm going to, because of that, I'm opening up an incredible door of opportunity to you. That's what he's saying. And that has happened to me many, many times in my life. I get a little stale and maybe backslide a little bit. I don't know if you want to call it that, but just not as close to God as I really want to be or need to be. Or I, In fact, I know it's not exactly where God wants me, but he gives me these opportunities. And through those opportunities, it draws me closer to him. Does that make sense? When I step through the doors that he has opened for me. And when God has opened so many doors for me and Becky and my family and for Light in the Valley. He has opened doors that there's no way that any one of us could have opened. And yet here we are. Sometimes I find myself like pinch myself like am I here? This is awesome. And it's God opening doors that I would have never, ever opened on my own. Being a pastor at Light in the Valley is not something that I would have probably chosen. <clears throat> I love all of you. I wanted to be a businessman. And yet, God opened that door. And here I am. Here you are. We couldn't have done this, any of us, on our own, right? What, what doors are, is God opening for you? What doors do you know that he wants you to go through? I believe that God has many unbelievable doors to open for each and every one of you. Doors to your future. Doors to your dreams, your ideas, your visions, the things that you want to live out in life. God wants you to live a fulfilled life. And so I ask you, and this is a challenge for 2023, what doors is God going to open for you between now and the end of 2023? Are you, are you prepared for it? Have you been preparing for it? Are you getting ready for it? 
Or are you just sitting idly by and like, well, when a door opens, I'll run in. Well, let me tell you, there's going to be all kinds of doors opening for you. You have to know which door to go through. And I want to look at a couple lessons. I could go on and on and on about the doors that God has, has led and open for me and for Becky and our family. I could go on and on, but I, I, I picked out just a few of the lessons that I've learned walking through open doors from God. And the number one thing, if you want to write notes, take notes, this is the number one lesson that I've learned in going and in, in following God's leading, looking for open doors is every door, every door is a decision. That's, the, that's what I want you to align. What is a door? It's a decision. You have decisions to make. Every day you have tons and tons and tons of decisions to make. And it's just as many of those as you do doors that you walk through in your home. Does anybody know exactly offhand how many doors are in your home? I bet Jonas does. He just built a house. How many doors are in your home? No idea. Well, you went through the right one this morning. You got out and you got here. Many, many doors. Those are decisions that we make every single day. Those are doors that are opening one after the other consecutively. And in the Bible, doors are metaphors of the choices and decisions that we make every day. And I will tell you, your choices, and I went through this, your choices, not your circumstances, determine your destiny. It's not the circumstance that you go through. It's the choices that you make as you're going through those. It's more than anything else. That's what determines your future and your destiny. Every door that you walk by, every decision that you are facing, you have a choice. Am I going to walk through it or am I going to walk past it? And pretty early in life, you learn which doors are safe to walk through and which ones aren't. Some you can't walk through. And some you're not worthy of walking through. But every time you see a door, you have a decision to make. Do I go through it or do I not? That's life. Every door is a decision. Number two, my destiny, my future will be shaped by which doors I walk past and which doors I walk through. I'll say that again. My destiny or my future will be shaped by which doors I walk past and which doors I walk through. Your destiny is determined by your decisions, your choices that you make. And the tough part is, for me, is knowing which one is the right door. How many of you ever walked through a wrong door? Literally, walked through a wrong door. Uh huh. How did that feel? How many walked into the door? <laughs> uh, bad one, I'm sorry. It's, it's tough to get back on track when you walk through a wrong door, is it not? Depending how it all goes, it's really tough to get back on track. And that's the same way in life. When we make a bad choice and we go through a wrong doorway, it's not easy to get back on track. A lot of times it's bad use of our money. It's bad use of our energy. It's a bad use of our time. And it's a bad use of our efforts, right? And it's, it's tough to think that I have to make all of that back up. But you got to get back and go through the correct door. Make the good decision to get back on track. So what do we need to know up front in order to make wise decisions about which door that we open or that we go through, that God opens for us? And I will tell you, as simple as this, it's discernment. And Scripture tells me that discernment is a gift. And it's a gift that God gives us. <coughs> And I will tell you, the closer that your relationship is with God, the closer that you walk with him, the more discernment you will have. And the more discernment you have, the more wise you're going to be. And the more wise you are, the better choices that you will make. God says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15, says it like this. This is my, the translation that I use. Today I am giving you a choice. You can choose life and success or death and disaster. This is a choice that God gives us. He gives us free will to make choices. 
He doesn't press down his perfect will on our lives and force us to do something. We have choice and we can choose whether it's life and success or death and disaster. Here's the problem. Sometimes you can't see what's behind the door, right? I, uh, I remember watching these game shows and I, we were arguing about which one it was, but I think it was The Price is Right. Remember that? And, like, and I, they, they all like guess this price and then, and then the winner gets to go up. And then sometime throughout the whole game, there's like three doors and you get to choose, right? Is that the game I'm talking about? And it's either... Door one has a candy bar and door three has a car, right? You remember that? Like, it's, it's not the same. And you get to choose which one. You better make the right choice. And so we want to make sure that we choose the right door so that we're not wasting our time, our energy, and efforts for the rest of our lives. How do we make those decisions? It's through discernment. And I believe we need to pray every day that God would give us discernment. That's part of my daily prayer that God would give me discernment, give me wisdom. And you know what? I even added one. Don't just give me wisdom. Give me knowledge of how to apply the wisdom. Does that make sense? Or am I the only dumb one? Nobody's answering. Give me Knowledge of how to apply the wisdom. I want to be in God's will. And I want to open the correct doors. Because my destiny and your destiny is determined by the decisions that we make. Number three. And this is a three-part one. So it's basically three, four, five. There will be five. Or, yeah. A door, number one. A door may be an opportunity from God. And these are the doors that we want to go through. When God gives us an opportunity, that's the one we want to go through. But we got to make sure through discernment and through prayer and through pleading with God and asking God to give us the wisdom, is this the correct one? I believe that this year, this next year, if we do that corporately as a group and you do it individually, God is going to show us and open up many, many doors wide open. I believe that with all my heart, it will be an amazing life. Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, and I, I wrote this out of the message, so don't even put it up. Well, you can the message translation of 1 Corinthians 16, 9 says this. A huge door of opportunity for good work has opened up here. And at the end of it, at the end of it in, in the message it says, but there is mushrooming, mushrooming opposition. So there's going to be a lot of opposition. Just because a huge door of opportunity for good works shows up doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. I wrote here that opportunity plus opposition actually equals God's will. When God opens a door for you, it is the right door. It doesn't mean that it's problem free. It doesn't mean that it's going to go exactly as planned. I promise you, it's not. And I said it before this morning. I said anything worth having is an uphill battle. You may open that door and run right into something that you, you never suspected. God's will is not a problem-free life. How many would agree with that? But God's will means you live the life, and I will help you get through and solve your problems. We're going to have opposition. Where there's an opportunity, Paul says there's opposition. Great opposition is what he said. I will tell you that whenever there's an opportunity from God, it's very, very rare that it's not opposed with evil. We should expect opposition when we know we're doing the right thing. My father is in stage three dementia. Hilarious at times, heartbreaking in others. I laughed. <laughs> I laughed more at him this past week and, than I have in a long time just because I was around him. And, and uh, so we as a family in the past 
three, four months, we've been praying, God, show us what to do. Mom and dad are at the place where they can't take awesome care of themselves anymore. We need, we need some help. What are we going to do? And all of a sudden, God started opening doors. There were doors open that no man could have opened. A brand new house came up for sale in Sarasota, Florida. No one had ever lived in it. And here we go. Would it actually work that mom and dad could, yeah, 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 yeah. And it was just like, boom, you understand? And so we, we were all very, very, very confident that we're doing the right thing. So, my, uh, of course, I get voted in to drive the U-Haul from South Carolina to Florida. And so my brother and I, my brother from Canton, we get in my pickup and we drive to South Carolina. And from there, I was going to fill a U-Haul and, and take it to Florida. They were only getting a U-Haul full because the rest of the stuff they didn't need. And so it, things got distributed among the kids and whatnot. So the first morning, my sister from Pennsylvania, they flew in and got a rental car. First morning, everybody's starting at 7.30. Everybody needs to be there, you know, and they're not there. Like, what in the world? Here they come driving in with a donut on the back. You know what I'm talking about? A little spare tire. Like, what in the world? And he goes, oh, I don't know. He said, we had a flat tire this morning. That was the first morning. He spends, because it's South Carolina, Glenn, back me up on this. There's no, like, it's, tires are scarce. You know what I mean? We burn them for fun. But that, like, to have them as a spare to put on a vehicle, it's not going to happen. So he's running all the way around Aiken, calling into Augusta, trying to find a tire for this particular, this particular size. Glenn, am I wrong? Stuart, am I wrong? No, we can't find tires. Like, we swing on them and we burn them. We, we have fun with them. So to, to use them, and it was just a trying day. An attack from the enemy, right? Took him three quarters of a day to get the tire. Now, that's what he said. Meanwhile, we're loading the U-Haul. See what's happening here. So the next morning, we're starting at 6 because we know we're running behind now. Like, so we're starting at 6. And I don't know, down there in South Carolina, uh, how many know the story when Jesus uh, relieved the legion, the demons into the pigs? Y'all with me? Well, that morning he released them into the deer. He was at the other end, and they all came flying out and ran right into the side, the back quarter panel of my sister's new vehicle. And by now, we're freaking out. Like, what's going on here? And so we gathered as a family, we held hands, and we stood in a circle, and we started to pray. See, I, I think sometimes we take it as, oh, that's just life, and I, and I, and I can get caught up in that too. It's just life. But this dear... It came out of nowhere. That flat tire, it was brand new tire. What could be happening here? And you know what? After we prayed, we asked God to relieve us of all the darts that were coming our way. We felt it. We knew we were doing the right thing, but there was opposition there big time. The rest of the uh, trip went well. I had Becky fly down on Thursday, and uh, my father uh, did not know who she was. And when we finally explained it to him, he said, oh, you've been married 25 years. He said, oh, that's, uh, that's embarrassing. I said, I know, right? Uh, <laughs> sorry, Matt. She didn't think that was funny. Pray for him. It's not the way he wants to be. It's not fun to see someone you love go through something like that. But uh, then on Wednesday, I called. I talked to him, and uh, he actually asked me how Becky and the kids are doing. So it comes and it goes. 
It comes and it goes. So, uh, But there was opposition there for us to get them to where we knew their destiny needed to be. Does that make sense? When you're doing it right, when you're, th there's going to be things that come up in your life. And you've got to recognize it for what it is. And you call the ace an ace. And you take care of it through the blood of Jesus. Number three, a door may just be an opportunity from God. That's one. But it may also be a distraction for, from others. And a lot of you know what I'm talking about. Oh, you are so good at this. The gift you have in this. Oh, you need to be doing this. Oh, you need to be doing that. And they, there's so many offers and there's things coming at you that you start to get distracted. There's so many doors that are being opened. And a lot of times, if you're not being discerning in the Spirit, if, the, if you don't have the Holy Spirit to help you discern through that, you'll end up being sidetracked, off track, or at a dead end. And that's why you... More than ever, you need to have discernment because not every door is an opportunity from God. Sometimes there are distractions from other people. They're not good opportunities. They're there to distract you. Don't miss the doors that God has for you. So a door may be an opportunity from God. It may be a distraction from others. Or the way that Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, he says it's a trap from Satan. Sometimes a door can be a trap from Satan. In the translation that I have, it says, get away from me, Satan. This is Jesus speaking. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are looking at things merely from a human viewpoint and not from God. And any time that we look to and look at our future from a human viewpoint instead of God, that is a trap. When we look at our problems from a human viewpoint and not from God, it's a trap. So you got to know, is the door an opportunity from God? Is it a distraction from others? Or is it a trap from Satan? Number four, if you're writing it down, if an open door is truly from God, and this is one that has been so important to me in the last few years. If an open door is truly from God, then it will never, ever contradict his word. Can I get an amen on that? God tells us in his word, don't do this, don't do this, or do this and do that. It's very, very plain. Every, every instruction that you need to get through your life is right here. <clears throat> and God will never, ever tell you something different or show you an opportunity that's different and that doesn't reflect his word and that contradicts his word. It won't do it. If the door is telling you something different, then I'm telling you that's not from God. I had, uh, Becky and I, you know this, we, we mentor uh, couples and uh, had an individual that, and I, I'm, I'm going to paint a different picture, but I'm going to get to it, okay? So marriage not going good, right? There's dissatisfied inside of the marriage. It's not, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And one day, just, oh, the door was open. And a beautiful woman came in and worked right beside this individual. And the next thing you know, he's telling me she is respectful. We, she doesn't complain. Uh-oh. She compliments me. This must be in door from God because me and my wife ain't getting along. And as it goes longer and longer and longer, all of a sudden there's a connection and then there's an attraction and then they, he started foolishly comparing tangerines and submarines. You know what I'm talking about? They sound the same, but they're opposite. And the next thing you know, there's an affair. He started compromising it. And now he's justifying his action because he feels like he's never had a connection. This is our soulmate. This is my soulmate, man. you got to know that. The door, God is opening this door for me. I know it is. And I'm here going, no. Can you be forgiven for it being in an affair? Absolutely. I was. Let's put it out there. But is it... Is it the way that God wants it? No, it's not. So you're not going to tell me that that is an open door that God has given you. You're not going to do that to me. You know, I know God just wants me to be happy. 
I would tell you what, you start studying scripture and you start doing the things that scripture tells you to do to your wife. Hey, man, you start treating her like a queen, she'll treat you like a king, I promise you. We can go into deeper than later if you want. But it's not an open door from God. Am I making sense? Or am I speaking to mutes? Say amen. You ask me, well, why is it not? But Scripture has a lot to say about it. I'll just go through a couple of them. Proverbs says, whoever commits adultery is a fool. Second Proverbs says, uh, uh, Proverbs 2 says, whoever commits adultery destroys his own soul. Sorry, I don't have that up there. So you're going to tell me that that is an open door from God? I don't think so. It's forgiven. It can be forgiven. But it's not an open door from God. Bible says it causes all kinds of pain for generations, not just your life, but for generations to come. Becky and I have never met anyone involved in that that says it was painless. <laughs> it's an emotional pain. It's spiritual pain. It's physical pain. It's financial pain. The list goes on and on of the pain that comes with that always. That is not an open door from God if it contradicts his word, it is not an open door from God. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. I see I need to hurry. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. That tells me that what was true a thousand years ago and a thousand years before that is true today, and it will be a true a thousand years from today. His word never changes. Number five, sometimes God shuts a door for my protection. You think it's a bad thing when things go wrong, right? So sometimes he shuts a door for our protection. Genesis chapter 7, verse 16, it says this, then God shut the door. Then the Lord shut him in. You know where that's talking about? It's Noah. Noah and the ark. I'll never forget, when, uh, how many have went to the ark encounter down, down in Kentucky? Isn't that awesome? One of the most biggest takeaways for me was when I stood at the door. How many saw that door? And I thought in my mind, when that door shut, no man could open it. And everything inside was protected. Sometimes God shuts the door to protect us. Nobody can open it. It doesn't feel good sometimes, but it's for our protection. Number six, God will open doors for me. If I open doors for others, we're just talking about a simple generosity thing. And I will tell you, Light in the Valley, what I've experienced, but Becky and I have experienced from you guys through generosity to us and to other people. I tell people all the time, our congregation is one of the most giving, most generous congregations. I'll put you up pound to pound for any congregation in Holmes County, in the state of Ohio, and anywhere else. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt, that's one of the reasons that God is expanding our footprint because of your generosity. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm not, I, not at all. I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about your giftings. I'm talking about things uh, outside of just wealth. Proverbs eleven twenty-five 25 says this, anyone who generally blesses others will be generously blessed. And when you refresh others, you will be refreshed yourself. I see it happen over and over and over in this congregation. My hat goes off to you. One of the most generous group of people that I've ever met. And it's an honor to be a part of this. There are more promises in Scripture, did you know this, that surround, promises in Scripture that surround the, the subject of generosity than any other subject. And it's not just money and tithing. I, we have people mentoring people. We have uh, people serving people. We have people joining us in our kids, uh, in our kids church. We, there's just a lot of that serving attitude, the generosity through that. And it's much, much appreciated. Maybe, maybe you are generous with your home. I know Becky and I, a few years back, we made our mission statement for our home that God's love would be shown in our home through hospitality to everyone that comes in. 
And it's amazing what God has done through that. That's just a simple mission statement that we came up with. But hospitality is a generous thing. It's, it's, it, and when you have generosity, you're showing love. God, for God so loved the world that he gave, right? He gave. It shows love when we give. Brennan, if you'll bring the team up. I had to think of Job, one of the verses in Job chapter 31, verse 32 says, uh, I have never turned away anyone, but I have opened my doors to everyone. We're just going to read it from the screen. But no stranger had to spend the night in the street, for my door was always open, open to the traveler. And if you know anything about Job, before he lost everything, he was the wealthiest man in the land. And after God restored everything, he was the, twice as wealthy, right? And I don't believe it was an accident. I believe it was because of his generous heart. Amen? Are they, are they with me? Are, did you, I can't see them. Are they sleeping? Amen? He had an open door policy. And I know that's one of the reasons that God has blessed us so tremendously here at Light in the Valley. We have an open door policy. Always open for whoever wants to come in. I want to open my doors for others. The more we open doors for others, let me just tell you, this is not a prosperity message, I promise you. But the more you open doors for others, the more that God will open doors for you. That's just how it works. That's just how it works. Here's my final one, if you guys would stand. The lesson that I learned one of the lessons that I learned is that sometimes God cracks open a door just to give you a glimpse of your future long before you're ready to walk through it. Why? It's to inspire me to grow. Because if I see through the crack that that's where God wants to take me and I'm not ready to go there, I'm going to work on getting ready. I'm going to study. I'm going to practice. I'm going to get it right because I know that God's taken me there. I had to think of how I was called to the ministry. I literally had a vision of that. I think I explained that to you guys here a couple Sundays ago or before, before Christmas. I had a vision that I was doing this long before I was ready. It scared me so bad that I actually started getting ready. Does that make sense? Some things had to change. Not just in, not just in our spiritual life, but it, it, things started to progress. And here we are. God brought it to pass. Because when we see that vision, if he cracks that door and you see it, and you have a dream, you have a vision, you, have, you see what God has in store for you, I want to encourage you, let it help you grow. The only person, guys, that can, that can ruin your destiny, the only person is you. God won't, Satan can't, and other people can't, but you can by continually making the wrong choices. You can choose to ruin your life or waste it, or you can choose to go through the right doors. My encouragement for you in 23 is to go after your dreams and your visions. Live out the life and the purpose that God has for you. Pray for discernment and believe in your destiny. But here's one thing, and I'm going to leave it with you. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, can you put that up there? The things, take it off. Listen to this one. It's the same different translation. The things that I am planning for you, this is God speaking through prophet. They won't happen right away, but slowly, steadily, surely the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. This is my prayer for you guys that you understand this. And if it seems slow, do not despair for these things will surely come to pass. Just be patient. They will not be overdue a single day. God has it all in his hands and his timing is right. But I'm telling you, look to him. He will open the doors. You'll need discernment. You'll need courage. And you'll, you'll need to be generous. 
learn how to open doors for others. Would you pray with me?